Booth War in 1860 was probably the most exciting event uh, in Ripon's history. Uh, for three weeks, uh, we were ready to take on the United States government on the issue of slavery. Uh, <clears throat> and the Booth War occurred almost exactly 150 years ago, uh, so we're celebrating it uh, tonight uh, with a discussion uh, of what happened during the war. We're fortunate to have with us tonight uh, two, uh, probably the two leading experts in the Wolf War, two leading experts in the country, I suspect. Uh, <clears throat> Russell Blake, who is professor of history uh, at Ripon College uh, and has been there nearly 30 years. Nearly? Yeah. Um, 29, yeah. Yeah, 29. And who has done, uh, not only conducts classes over here, on Ripon history, uh, but done quite a bit of research on the war. And then, of course, George Miller, uh, who you probably all know, uh, uh, authored the uh, book on the history of Ripon. And <clears throat> if you're wanting to know what the mayor of Ripon had for breakfast in 1877, it's February 9th, George will be able to tell you and be able to go over the controversy over whether it really was two legs or three. Uh, so, with that, I'll turn the, uh, turn the meeting over to Russ and George. Well, the, the way we're gonna, the way we're gonna handle this is, uh, I'm gonna do a few introductory remarks uh, about the Booth War, to hopefully put it into better, larger historical context, and then George, who uh, will, will tell us a lot more about the Booth War itself. Without stealing any of George's thunder, let me just say that the whole uh, issue of the Booth War involved a runaway slave. There was a slave named Joshua Glover who ran away from the South uh, trying to get freedom, which probably meant uh, getting to Canada. Uh, in 1854, Glover was apprehended by U.S. Marshals um, in Milwaukee and uh, put in jail there, and a man named Sherman Booth uh, who was a newspaper editor in Milwaukee, broke him out of jail, uh, helped by a mob of people. Um, how that connects with Ripon is what, is what George is going to tell us about. What I want to start off with is to talk a little bit about runaway slaves in the um, pre-Civil War period and why the issue of runaway slaves became such uh, an important one, one that would have really inflamed the patients, not only of folks here in Ripon, but people all around um, the country. Slaves have been running away from slavery uh, ever since the colonial period, and uh, slaveholders had been really, really interested ever since the colonial period in figuring out how to get their slaves returned to them. Uh, when the Constitution was written in 1787, a provision of the Constitution said that Northerners had to return fugitive slaves to the South. Slaves were not mentioned in the Constitution because the Founding Fathers, the first politically correct people in American history, did not want to use the term slave. But they said in the Constitution, no person held in service in one state and escaping into another shall be discharged from service thereby. Uh, that was a nice way of saying if you ran away from Virginia to Pennsylvania uh, and you were apprehended, you had to be sent back south. Uh, that meant that in order for a slave to get away and be assured of being permanently free, he or she not only had to escape to the north, but after 1830, they had to escape to Canada. Canada, as along with the rest of the uh, British Empire, had abolished slavery around 1830, and Canada was therefore a safe haven from that point onward, and that was where most of the slaves uh, were, were, were headed. Also right around 1830, the anti-slavery movement it became prominent in the North, and with the rise of the anti-slavery movement, lots and lots and lots of Northerners decided that they wanted nothing to do with apprehending runaway slaves. To them, that was involving them in a system which they found increasingly immoral and antithetical to American ideals. And they saw runaway slaves as freedom fighters, as men and women that were heroes, as people 
who had the courage, the fortitude, and the ingenuity to get away from slavery, and the last thing they wanted to do is, is apprehend these people. In a few states in the North, uh, personal liberty laws were passed. These were laws that the state passed which said our state will not cooperate in returning fugitive slaves to the South. Southerners got really upset at personal liberty laws. Correctly, from a legal standpoint, they said these laws are unconstitutional. The Constitution says that you got to return fugitive slaves uh, to the South, but uh, there was a standoff, not the first one in this era, between what a state wanted and what the Constitution seemed to demand. In 1850, the Fugitive Slave Law was passed, and it was part of an elaborate compromise made in 1850 which involved California coming into the Union as a free state. That's what the North got out of that controversy, California uh, be having slavery excluded. But what the South got was the passage of a fugitive slave law, which put teeth into the constitutional provision that slaves had to be returned to the South. Very heavy fines were levied on law enforcement officials, which could mean local sheriffs or judges in the North that refused to cooperate with Southern officials in apprehending and returning fugitive slaves. So a Southerner could write to a judge in Ohio and he could say, my slave and name such and such and six foot two and, three, and 230 pounds has run away and I think he's in Hamilton, Ohio and you're uh, a judge in Hamilton, Ohio. I want you to see to it that he is secured put in jail, write to me, I'll come get it. If that judge wouldn't cooperate in that, then the slaveholder could go to a, a federal court and get a heavy fine levied on that law enforcement official. That obviously was very, very, very controversial in northern states. Now here was the federal government forcing northerners to do something that they thought was wrong. And um, they didn't like that. So even after the Fugitive Slave Law, in fact, probably more so because of the Fugitive Slave Law, a lot of people in the North not only aided slaves in running away to Canada, the so-called Underground Railroad, but they also uh, aided slaves that had already been arrested by breaking them out of jail. Um, Joshua Glover wasn't the only slave broken out of jail. One more point, and uh, then we'll turn it over uh, to George. Um, you all have heard of the novel Uncle Tom's Cabin, published in 1852, not coincidentally, two years after the Fugitive Slave Law was passed. One of the most famous passages in Uncle Tom's Cabin is the several chapters where the slave woman Eliza, who is a slave in Kentucky, escapes from slavery with her small child in her arms running across the ice flows on the Ohio River. Uh, the Ohio River is just breaking up from the winter's ice, and Eliza, for one very long chapter, jumps from ice flow to ice flow, almost being swept under the river at several po points, but she eventually gets to Ohio, and from there, she eventually gets to Canada, and is eventually united with her husband and the father of their child, and they live happily ever after in Canada. That novel, part of that novel's appeal was that it captured in, very, in, the, in a 19th century sentimental way the very true feeling that lots of Northerners had that these slaves who ran away were to be honored and helped and, and, and not to be apprehended and, and, and taken back. So in that kind of a larger context, it might be easier for us to understand the actions that uh, Sherman Booth took in breaking Joshua Glover out of jail and more so the actions that many, many people here in Ripon took in aiding Sherman Booth and uh, showing that they did not believe in the fugitive slave law either. Uh, so now we'll hear about the Booth War itself. Okay. <clears throat> Excuse my uh, cough. I least uh, probably will break out before we we're through this evening, but uh, we'll do the best we can. Uh, first, uh, who was Booth? Uh, he was the editor of the Milwaukee uh, Free Democrat. And uh, it was, as he was, violently anti-slavery. And Booth probably, 
uh, was the um, the leading advocate of abolition in the state of Wisconsin uh, at, at the time of the uh, of, of the uh, war. Um, <coughs> He gets involved uh, actively in uh, this process uh, with the escape of Joshua Glover, the, the slave who belonged to a, uh, uh, a slaveholder, I don't know whether he was a planter or not, uh, in uh, Missouri, which was a slave state. And, uh, uh, he, uh, the, uh, <coughs> uh, the, ca the case uh, attracted a good deal of attention. Uh, Glover did make, I mean, get out of the South. In other words, he was able to cross the Mississippi into Illinois, came up into the state of Wisconsin, uh, and uh, for a while lived in um, uh, uh, in, uh, in the state without attempting to go on to Canada because he had found uh, a group of uh, free uh, African Americans uh, that he liked and so he kind of moved into their neighborhood and uh, lived there for uh, a couple of years. Well then one of his so-called friends turns him in. <laughs> And uh, uh, the uh, uh, clever is, uh, uh, of course, uh, arrested uh, and held and uh, moved eventually into a jail in uh, Milwaukee. And this attracts the attention of Booth violently opposed to the fugitive slave law and thus thinks that uh, great injustice is being done by uh, putting uh, this man uh, uh, in uh, uh, jail. Uh, the uh, crowds that gathered in opposition to this um, uh, finally just simply broke into the jail, uh, freed his brother, and uh, in a sense sent him on his way on the Underground Railroad. Uh, and eventually he does get to Canada. Uh, he finished his life, I believe, in a uh, uh, suburb of Toronto. And uh, Okay, so in a sense, he disappears from the story. But Booth, you see, is, has been in violation of the fugitive slave law because he not only uh, didn't help with the uh, uh, arrest and detention of uh, Glover, uh, but he helped him Glover escape. Uh, well, okay, so he's put in jail. Uh, as Russ uh, indicated, the state of Wisconsin, like many other northern states uh, at this time, uh, had passed a personal liberty law, which made it just as hard to uh, effectively uh, enforce the fugitive slave law in the three states as they possibly could. Uh, and. Uh, uh, so in a sense, you see, you have two laws operating uh, at the same time. You have uh, the federal law, which has been broken clearly by Booth, uh, and uh, okay, then at the same time, you have Booth uh, doing the, what he can, you see, to uh, make, make it impossible for the uh, federal officials to uh, uh, to get him. Uh, 
so in other words, he is being, he's sub being subjected to two different uh, legal systems. Uh, and he claims that when there is a uh, overlapping of like this, uh, that the state has the final jurisdiction. And uh, this is a, going back to Jefferson's time you know, of uh, uh, the uh, uh, when, when, at a time when the states, of course, had far more power than they did uh, at the time of the Wolf uh, War. Uh, <coughs> now, um, Booth succeeds in sending his lawyer to see a judge getting a writ of habeas, habeas corpus under the state law. Uh, the slave is then uh, brought out for the judge, uh, and, or for the court, and uh, the, uh, uh, the courts decide that there is insufficient uh, uh, evidence to justify holding Booth. And uh, so, okay, Booth is turned loose. He's been turned loose by this state jurisdiction. You see, the federal law still thinks he ought to be in jail. Okay, uh, now this, if the, uh, uh, the state is right, see then they have the power of nullification. In other words, they can say this law is unconstitutional in Wisconsin. It cannot be enforced by uh, federal authority. All right. The man who wrote this um, justification for uh, the nullification of the federal law uh, was a man who quite by chance happened to live in Ripon. He had been the founder of the Republican Party. Uh, and then in one of the first elections in which the Republican Party participated here in Wisconsin, uh, he uh, was elected to the State Assembly. And uh, he's put in, made chairman of the Federal Relations uh, Committee and uh, he then writes this document justifying the nullification of a federal law. Uh, but it's so okay in a sense. This is when Ruben really gets involved uh, in this situation. Now, uh, Ruben at this time, and this is 1854. That's when the, the arrest, yeah. And uh, um, it's, the city of Ripon is growing very rapidly uh, and it attracted a very large number of anti-slavery people. Now, why this was is an interesting question, uh, but of course it's important to our story. Um, partly it's simply a matter of timing. That is, the westward movement, in a sense, has reached central Wisconsin uh, at, at this time, and you have people pouring in to take up the good land, take the land for the growing of wheat, uh, and uh, uh, so that uh, 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 the, the state is beginning to fill up. Now, where did these people come from? Well, almost all of them, it would seem, came from either upstate New York or New England. Uh, and those of them in upstate New York had been New Englanders. Uh, so, okay, uh, it's because of the timing when a lot of these people have decided to move west to take advantage of the good land in Wisconsin. Uh, uh, the, the great ma majority of the people that are making this move are uh, 
New Englanders or New Yorkers, and uh, they are uh, uh, bringing with them their ideas concerning reform. Now, the 1840s is often referred to as an age of reform. Uh, it's, it's very interesting because some of the ideas for the reforms are, are quite radical in a sense, and yet these people were not radicals. Most of them were members of the Whig Party. The Whig Party tended to be the conservative party. But uh, the point is <laughs> they're anti-Southern. And it happened that uh, uh, you see the things that the changes that they want to make are, are changes that the Southerners do not want, and particularly the abolition of slavery. Uh, but there are other things too. This is when you have the beginning of the women's rights movement. Which, you know, these same people <coughs> are advocating equal rights for women. Uh, this is a time when probably the favorite reform movement was temperance. Uh, and, uh, uh, okay, uh, it's not unusual then that some of them uh, were involved in rather radical systems of reforming uh, societies. And of course, um, one of the uh, uh, movements for reform is sometimes referred to as utopian socialism, uh, and established a experimental colony here in Ripon, called the Wisconsin Phalanx. And in 1844, they settled down in the western part of what is now Ripon, and uh, began trying out a system of reform. It didn't work at all. Uh, but they were very good at promoting <laughs> their program and they gave it lots of publicity. And people in New York who were reading a newspaper published by a man named Horace Greeley in the New York Tribune uh, <clears throat> were reading many, many letters from these people living out in Wisconsin and this magnificent new system of, of urban living. Uh, uh, there is no question about it working. Well, it wasn't working at all, but uh, nevertheless, a lot of people uh, thought it was, and uh, many of these people were uh, moving west looking for just for such uh, opportunities to be a part of a new experiment in a new way of life. And. Uh, well, okay. One of the people that came west was a man named Alvin Bobay. Uh, he was a friend of Horace Greeley's. Uh, he was uh, actively involved in many different reform movements, which was typical uh, of the time. In other words, if they were uh, temperance people, it wasn't surprising if they were for women's rights. Uh, if they were uh, anti-slavery, uh, they probably were for some kind of land reform. Well, it happened that uh, Bobet was one of those interested in land reform, but also in those aspects of the anti-slavery movement, well, which were related to it. In other words, they were trying to keep slavery out of the territories so that it could be given to, uh, to the working people in the country. And they could have it virtually for free because every man in the country should be, uh, should have at least, uh, uh, I guess, a, you know, a quarter section of land. It was their right. Uh, all right. Uh, well, he brings these, these ideas with him, you see. And uh, um, that land reform, which came to be known as the Homestead Act, see, uh, uh, became a part of the platform of the Rep Republican Party. And uh, uh, 
okay. Uh, so you have um, Beauvais actively involved in reforms in Wisconsin, now in the legislature, now working for, uh, uh, working against the, uh, the fugitive slave law. Now, it's not <coughs> unusual, you see, to have people like that involved in amongst the settlers. Uh, two others deserve mention because they were very much involved in the uh, war. One was man was Edwin Edward Daniels, who was a, uh, a school teacher, uh, taught in the Sarasco School, the Octagon School, pictured in uh, one of the heritage prints. Uh, and uh, uh, a rabid abolitionist. Um, and uh, one of his students, a man named Hugh Grange, the fellow over the uh, copy machine there and with a Civil War uniform. Um, and he too uh, uh, became a, a teacher in the uh, uh, Octagon School. And uh, then uh, he went on to read law, uh, became a lawyer, but then moved uh, west to see him moved to Britain. And he and um, Daniels uh, became quite an active pair in the uh, uh, anti-slavery movement. Uh, and when we say they became active, they became very active. In other words, they were very much involved in the founding of the Republican Party here in Ripon, which would have been in the early 50s. In the mid-50s, they went out to Kansas and participated in all the problems in, in Kansas. Uh, uh, when the, there was this fight as to whether or not Kansas should be slave or free. Okay, they went out there to help make Kansas free. Uh, and not much came of that. Uh, a lot of uh, trouble. Uh, and then they returned to Ribbon just in time to have the Supreme Court hand out a decision in the case of Abelman versus Booth. And uh, Actually, Abelman uh, versus Booth uh, is probably not as important a case as say the Dred Scott decision. On the other hand, it was directed specifically at what was going on here in uh, Wisconsin and in, in Griffin. Uh, so, okay, what the court said in Abelman versus Booth. Uh, was that if there are if there are these two systems of law trying to operate in the same territory, in the same state, uh, it is uh, the federal law, according to our Constitution, prevails. And so, in other words, uh, Booth was wrong. Uh, but he was wrong only legally. Uh, he wasn't wrong morally. And uh, so, uh, well, we'll just have to change our tactics. And so, and, uh, by now it's 1860, because it had always had to go through the courts uh, before it got to the point where there was a decision. Uh, and, uh, a, um, uh, Daniels, who was a, the intellectual, uh, the, uh, <clears throat> the organizer, uh, and combined with Lagrange, who was the doer, uh, the, the, exec the executive of the pair. And they get together a small man of men and 
They go down to Milwaukee, where Booth is in jail, and uh, um, uh, the Grange, who's armed, at the time goes in, holds up the judge, or the guard, uh, and uh, uh, releases Booth, and uh, uh, calmly locks up the, uh, the guard in Booth's cell. Mm -hmm. And then uh, they walk down, get in the carriage that's waiting for them, and drive out to uh, uh, Daniel's brother-in-law. And there they make plans for what they're going to do now that they've got him out of jail. And so they decide, well, uh, let's, let's get him get out of Milwaukee. And so uh, uh, they go outside Milwaukee and uh, get on a train in one of the suburbs. And they got as far as Waupon. And uh, then they spent the night in Waupon. Uh, the warden of the prison was an anti slavery man, was very glad to have him spend the night there. And uh, then sent word ahead that they were coming to Ribbon the next day and to prepare a kind of celebration. Uh, and okay. That's what they did. Next day they came up to Ripon in the evening and they had a huge turnout at the city building, which at that time was a spot where Dedrick Fury, I'm sorry, is, is no longer there, but uh, uh, that was the first city hall, so to speak, uh, for the city of Ripon. And it was, looks like everything was going fine, but of course, none of this was really done in secret. Yeah. Uh, and so uh, the federal marshals were able to follow them uh, without any problem at all, which they did. And then when, well, they, uh, or when uh, um, uh, Booth started to give his talk, uh, they went up on the stage and tried to arrest him. And so the crowd uh, objected to that, so physically threw him out of the building and took him back to the Davis Hotel where he was spending, where the marshals were spending the night. Okay, then meanwhile, uh, they passed resolutions at the meeting saying that Booth will never be arrested in prison. And they organized a, a, a league of, uh, to defend uh, 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 it was like uh, armed and prepared to defend uh, the freedom of a man who had been uh, found guilty by the federal government of a very serious crime. Uh, well, okay, for a couple of weeks uh, um, um, Booth uh, stayed in Daniel's house and then do you remember the uh, brick building that was on Church Street across from Soresco Park on the south side and it practically fell down but then the city had it torn down this was within just a few years Okay, and that is where Daniels lives, and that's where he kept um, Booth. Okay, but then they, <coughs> the marshals were getting organized, and so they figured we better um, get Booth out of here. And so they take him up to Pickett. And in Pickett, uh, he, he uh, um, stays with the, the Pickett family in Wilani, the house. And I guess that's still there, isn't it? The, uh, the Pickett house. And, okay. Uh, then the uh, marshals, of course, I 
get better organized. And uh, so one day they, uh, they get together a group of citizens, and all of the citizens of Griffin were not anti-slavery by any means. I mean, two of the uh, founders of the city were pro-Southern, and one of them was pro-slavery. Uh, and he happened to be Governor Horner, which is well, the, the, the group of three pictures over there in the upper left hand corner. That's, that's Horner. He was a Virginian appointed by Andrew Jackson uh, as the acting uh, governor of the first of the territory of Michigan and made secretary of the territory of Wisconsin. And uh, uh, they all went on a picket and were going to arrest Booth. And when they got there, practically every farmer in the county was there with a pitchfork or an axe and uh, daring them to try to get them to Booth. Well, they weren't looking for a battle. And so they finally just left, quietly. Uh, and, uh, uh, but they're, I mean, obviously now they're in a position to bring in more and more uh, uh, volunteers to help with them. And uh, so uh, they mean, well, we better get them out of picket. And so they moved over to Rosendale. <laughs> <laughs> now, this goes on for about three months. <laughs> and uh, uh, they keep moving him around. He was not a good house guest. <laughs> uh, and a lot of people think the reason they were moving him was they didn't want him to move him for very long. But uh, anyway, they, they kept him out of the hands of the marshals for you know, three months. And then it became Berlin's term. <laughs> All right. uh, and uh, he gave a talk to a, a, a ladies' club, and on the way home, they arrested him. And he did not have proper guards. And so he was rearrested and put back in jail. Uh, and in a sense, that was, that was the Booth War. In other words, but the interesting thing about it, you see, is this, uh, the, the law, in a sense, is making no difference, whatever, in all of this. Uh, I mean, I suppose it means the kind of the country is falling apart. Uh, because so many of these things that we've been talking about were in violation of established law. Uh, the business in Kansas involved, uh, this sort of thing. Uh, the, uh, getting, breaking people out of jail, all of this, and, and you know, they don't think twice about it. Naturally, that's what you do in a situation like this. But this, in a sense, indicates what the state of mind of the country was at this time. And, uh, well, uh, I guess that's understandable. Uh, after the um, uh, Civil War had been fought, and Walter the Grange and Daniel were uh, participating, although typically uh, Daniel, who's the intellectual, was a lousy soldier, and uh, the Grange was an excellent soldier, one that was a general, a brevet general, but a silver brevet general. And, uh, um, 
Joey Frange was beginning to sour on Booth. He didn't <laughs> like the guy uh, very much. And, uh, <clears throat> and when this was uh, after Booth had been put back in jail, uh, the Grange wrote him a letter saying he was thinking about turning himself in because you see all the people uh, that had been involved in this uh, are, uh, had been indicted and are under arrest and there's some documents over there on the table that uh, shows that. Uh, and Booth writes back and said, no, this isn't the time for talking, this is the time for, for action. Organize and arm your, your, your group and prepare for, for war. Uh, and he, he doesn't, doesn't bother him a bit. Well, LaGrange, by that time, said, uh uh, after the war, well, we have a letter that he wrote after the war saying that he thinks now that the that the whole thing was wrong, in other words, they never should have been uh, a, uh, a booth war. Uh, but, uh, uh, and of course the Civil War had turned into something horrible at that time, and uh, he certainly would never have done it that way again. So they didn't change their minds, but meanwhile, it, you know, and see, this is all happening in 1860, and then it takes a long, it takes 1861 before you get some of the court decisions. Um, uh, and so the Civil War interrupts any real, uh, uh, changes that might have been made at that time. Uh, in other words, uh, Booth is uh, pardoned by President Buchanan just before Buchanan leaves office. Uh, the others who were indicted uh, were pardoned by Lincoln. And so it all, all that is uh, wiped out. But uh, uh, it, uh, it was not a good time. So, uh, I've probably spoken longer than I should have there. Russ, do you want to add anything? No. Not really, no. I, I think that, I think we covered it. I think that, you know, the, 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 I agree with George that the big point to take away from this is that the Booth War is part of a whole series of things that's happening all over the country, in which groups of people, whole sections, whole states of people are saying a law that is legally binding is not morally binding. And people are making that distinction, that you do not have to follow laws. You, in fact, you should work against laws that, and, and, and break laws that are not uh, morally binding, or illegal, that, that, that are not moral. And the you know, South feels the same way. When, when, when you know, Lincoln says it's not, you don't have the right to secede, they said, who cares? That's just, you know, that's just one legal opinion. We got our own legal opinion. Everybody's gotten their own legal opinion, and ultimately that's why you've got the Civil War. Uh, because you cannot have, the, the issue of slavery is so, it so divides people. They're so passionate on it, there ultimately is no compromise on it. Um, now, just one more point, uh, right the year before the so-called Booth War, there was a lot more famous outbreak uh, called John Brown's Raid at Harper's Ferry, where John Brown, an abolitionist, uh, took several men and went to the federal arsenal of Harper's Ferry, Virginia, and captured uh, for three days. And his intent was to use the weaponry and the ammunition that was stored at Harper's Ferry and to move into the Appalachian Mountains and to set up a series of camps in the Appalachian Mountains and then put out the word to slaves all over the Carolinas 
that there's a place to run to now. You can run away and you don't have to get north. You just have to get to John Brown's camp and then you'll be a free man. Well, Brown, Brown didn't make it. He was, he was uh, captured and later hanged and a lot of his men were killed on the spot there at Harper's Ferry after holding the fort for a few days. Um, but there again, in the north, John Brown was seen as a hero, uh, a martyr. Uh, and people, prominent people all over the north, wrote him letters while he was in jail waiting to be hanged, saying, you, you're, you're our hero. You are finally a northerner standing up to slavery. And southerners, of course, saw this as final proof that everybody in the north uh, couldn't be trusted. They would have said the same thing and I, when they heard about Booth's War, and I'm sure because newspapers had no laws then and they all just copied from each other. So you got the news that way. When they heard about Booth's War, they said the same thing. These crazy people in Wisconsin are willing to go against the federal government to protect an outlaw who sprung a slave from jail. That's the kind of thing that made the South feel that they couldn't stay in a nation uh, with those kind of people, namely the Abraham Lincoln, in charge of them. So, so these things really do, I think, pretty directly lead, lead to the war. Uh, I guess uh, if you have questions for George, um, that would be next. Yeah, I want to just make two other comments. Uh, one side note of the Joshua Glover. Joshua Glover was freed, I think, in the first or second week of March, 1854, roughly a week and a half before the meeting in the Little White Schoolhouse. And the Glover, whole Glover affair was all over the state. As you know, what are we going to do next? Mm -hmm. So in a certain sense, along with Alvin Bovey, Joshua Glover is the founder of the Republican Party. Um, and secondly, um, when Glover was freed, he was put in various houses around Racine and so forth, and it was reported later, in line with what George and main point that George and Russ are making, it was reported later that a number of the people who housed him had real problems about the fact that they were breaking the law, and they were, they were even seeing their ministers about this, was it okay to do this? And what George suggested, and Russ suggests, by 1860, these qualms are gone. And that might show how the country has moved in about five or six, five or six years. I have a question. Uh, were the people that were involved in this war some of the same ones that um, uh, founded the socialist community in Ripon, or were these pretty much separate groups of people in the area? I mean, the pro-slavery, anti-slavery? No, were, they, were, the, were the people involved in the Booth War same as the Soresco community? Oh, yeah. no. Uh, although a, a surprising number of uh, the people that were active in it uh, either did uh, live in the in Soresco uh, or had came out here thinking that they were going to be a part of the Wisconsin Phalanx. Mm -hmm. uh, but the, the uh, Wisconsin Phalanx had fallen uh, before any of this, most of this happened. Okay. It, it, it folded in 1848. It only lasted from 44 to 48. So, and so, as, you know, the families, mm -hmm. some of the families that had come to Soresco were still in the area. Uh -huh. But uh, there was, I don't think any of the leaders of the Booth War were really directly Soresco people. Well, Mel uh -huh. Strong was, maybe. Yes, yeah, rather than strong family, who's one of the ones indicted there, they were a big Soresco <coughs> people. Um, so there were there were some connections. There there. Some. Yeah. Okay. Did I gather that part of this, even though Wisconsin officially became a state in 1848, at this point in time, though, it was still a rather open, almost frontier place, and you know those kind of people. Well, you know, they just kind of do what they want to do and they aren't always so, you know, they just, well, they may not even know exactly what the laws are. Is that, did that contribute to the whole kind of thing? Yeah, I suppose it might. Uh, but, uh, uh, I, I mean, I think they knew, uh, they knew what, what they were doing or, or 
negligent. They knew what they were not doing. Uh, and but they, they just thought it was right. And they didn't have any feeling of guilt. I do think the one thing that probably contributed to it is, of course, on a, in a frontier state, really everywhere in America, but in a rural in rural America, but especially in a frontier state, you don't have anywhere like the organized law enforcement yeah. you'd have today. You know, you don't have, you know, constables and county sheriffs and police departments and, and so on. There's just it's not that organized yet. And so you might have somebody that's the sheriff, but you don't have a department. So that allows, I think, them to be able to scurry booth around from place to place to place with, you know, you couldn't, it would be harder to do that today. Okay. Like if you took it to Rosendale, you'd probably get arrested for speeding, and then, <laughs> <laughs> that, I mean, I, you know, that would, that would have taken care of him right there. <laughs> the other thing we should keep in mind is that the early settlers in this area came from Vermont, New York, New Hampshire. In other words, they were, they were Americans when they came here. Then we had an immigration wave that came behind it. But usually they ended up more colonial in the sense that they organized cities and wanted everything they had back east as soon as they could get it. I'm intrigued by the statement that Booth was not a nice house <laughs> and I'm wondering what documentation you found. Was it from letters that people wrote, or how'd you find out what sort of a fella he was to have in your house? Probably letters. What, letters from the people who housed him? Uh, yeah. Yes. That's interesting. Huh? Mm -hmm. Those are still around. Yeah. Well, and I, when we have our copies of them. Original letter, but then we do have quite a lot of that kind of information. Well, he was, you know, he was uh, when he was up at uh, Pickett. Uh, every time they had a meal, he'd come down to dinner and he'd put his two revolvers out on the table and a Bowie knife. That's service. That's <laughs> but, uh, and he, we, all, we had the picture stuff of him, he doesn't look like a very nice wow. person. Either. What kind of nationality was Booth? Hmm. What would we be with the name Booth? English. German or English. 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 Probably. Don't miss the picture of him over here. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, he was employed by who? He, he was a newspaper editor. Yeah. He owned a newspaper in Milwaukee that was um, a, 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 the newspaper supported abolitionist causes. So he was a kind of a, you know, a, a, a professional at this. I mean, he, he was making his living as an agitator for the abolitionist cause and a propagandist, whatever you want to call it, uh, that's what he was. George, I, I was interested in that one part where, where Booth went uh, when he when they broke him out of jail from Milwaukee and he went to Wapan, and then they moved him up to Ripon, and then I think they were celebrating here in Ripon. You said, and then the marshals came and did they? Did, did you say the marshals arrested him and took him back? To Tried Davis? to arrest him. Oh. Yeah, I, there was was you? Did you mention Davis Hotel in there? I was just well. I mean, I, at that time, it would have been I think was called the Mapes House. Uh, but uh, the same you know, place. I, I remember it always since the day. Yeah. Yeah. So they they arrested or they tried to arrest her. They tried to arrest him and uh, the crowd. Uh, gathered their forces and threw them out. The marshals were staying at the hotel. Oh, I see. So the crowd basically said to the marshals, you know, it would be a good idea if you went back to the hotel, and uh, they did, because they were out them. Yeah. Okay. And the marshals were from? Milwaukee. Milwaukee. Yeah. And they were the ones that brought him up here. I couldn't hear some of that. They were uh, trying to apprehend him all the time. But, but again, you know, I mean, we think today of U.S. marshals, you think of, you know, Suddenly, you could get 50 guys together, and they would be all organized. But not then. You know, it's it's a lot looser then, and trying to get enough people to know where to come and and, and so on. They just don't have 
the, the organization, the manpower that law enforcement would have now. I think I just said the marshals were following him up. Yeah. They were following yeah. Booth up to rip him, trying okay. to look for the opportunity to yeah. arrest him. Right. Yeah. And as George said, he made no, they weren't at, at trying to be secretive about this. It was a celebration of, you know, let's go up to Ripon and have a speech. <laughs> <laughs> If there are no more questions, I will bring this to an end. Uh, we will have refreshments out on the table momentarily and take opportunity uh, to talk to Russ and, and, and George if you have other uh, personal issues and personal questions. So I want to thank you very much. I want to thank uh, Russ and George for presenting this very fine program.